Hello, welcome back as we continue our study of archaeology in support of the Bible. Now, as we look to the Bible, obviously the Bible is a record of history, and as such, it contains truths. But oftentimes, as we look to study the Bible with those who do, don't believe in God or don't believe in the Bible, sometimes it's difficult to show them passages from the Bible that support the Bible itself. We looked at that in the past lesson. But in this lesson, we want to continue looking at archaeological evidence that verifies the Bible. And another one of those areas which it does is in the location of cities. And this is really just another, what we could call, feather in the cap of the Bible. And as we previously saw, that those records that accurately describe the titles and, and the times in which they were used was accurate. Uh, we see another proof of the Bible's accuracy is in the location of cities and in the times that they were said to have existed. And we're going to examine some of the uh, cited cities mentioned in the Bible. Uh, when we look to the Bible, there are hundreds that have been verified through archaeology. And what this tells us is that the Bible is accurate in all that it tells us and that man can verify. And so we should also then believe the Bible in areas where that we have limited senses and we cannot examine. We see sometimes what people call is empirical evidence, and that being information acquired by firsthand observation or experimentation. And this information, it's acquired, it is part of scientific uh, process and method. Many times people look to this as what can be you know, tested by being reenacted. But the Bible verifies itself on many other aspects that can even be used scientifically. But we want to look at these cities. Well, in Numbers 21, in verse 1, and in 33, verse uh, 40, we read of a city named Arid. If you would look to Numbers 21, and we'll look at verse 1. It says, the king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atherim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And then in verse 30, or chapter 33, we look to verse 40. And it says, now the king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south in the land of Canaan, heard of the coming of the children of Israel. Well, we read that Arad is in the south, in the land of Canaan. This is according to the Bible. Well, from 1962 to 1984, excavations uh, have been done at two distinct locations. And they have discovered cities in the Negez Desert, located in the southern region of Israel. This is about 18 miles northeast of Beersheba, where Abraham made his home, as we read in Genesis 22 in verse 19. Well, archaeologists discovered that one of the sites was from a Canaanite city from the third millennium BC, or about 3000 BC, and on the southern slope of a hill. Well, on the summit of the hill were several... Um, fortresses that dated from the 10th to the 6th century BC or from 1000 to 6000 BC. Now this site fits with the times of the kingdoms of Israel and of Judah as well as the Persian Hellenistic and Roman periods or 5th century BC and 4 to the 4th century AD. Uh, and early Arab period from the 7th century to the 10th century. And during the Bronze Age, uh, which is about 2950 to 2650 BC, Arid was a large fortified and prosperous city and served as a capital for the Canaanite kingdom. The city was at a crossroad of two main trade routes, and it was also an area well suited for agriculture in, agriculture in its day and receiving twice the normal rainfall that it does today. Well, this city also had relations with the Egyptians, evidenced by numerous vessels made in Egypt that were found there, 
Also other items such as copper from the Sinai, uh, which indicated the trade or commerce was going on in this city. And this city is about 25 acres and had an estimated 2,500 people living there. It had walls, it had towers, it had streets, it had temples, it had a palace. Well, in the central room of that palace is a stele. It was found depicting two figures, one standing and one lying down. The finger outstretched and the heads depicted as ears of grain. Well, this represented the Mesopotamian god Tammuz. And the standing figure representing the half year of regeneration and growth, life, the other representing the other half of the year when plants wither, or death. Herod declined and was abandoned during the middle of the third millennium BC for unknown reasons. Possibly there was a climate change or nomadic populations that endangered the trade routes. We don't know. But during the times of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, that 10th to 6th century BC, Herod was used as a part of a series of citadels to protect trade routes in the Negev and the southern border, border of the kingdom. The first of these citadels was built by Solomon in the 10th century BC, and it had a well and a red, wet water reservoir in it. And there was also an Israelite temple with altars and evidence of burnt organic material in them. The courtyard of the temple and the altar dimensions are similar to that which are described in the Bible when we read Deuteronomy 27 and verse 5 in 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 13. The temple discovered at Arad is the only one known of outside of Jerusalem that possibly due to and possibly due to this being the first Israelite citadel. But it was destroyed, uh, apparently by the religious reforms under King Hezekiah of Judah at the end of the 8th century BC, as we read of in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, and in verse 22. But what we see is the city of Arad did exist just as the Bible describes. Also found in Arad were over 100 potsherds inscribed in biblical Hebrew. And this is the largest and oldest collection discovered in Israel from the biblical period. They date from all periods of the city's existence, and they include dates and names of several places. And from the letters to the commander of the citadel for rations, to soldiers' letters dealing with military matters, one requesting reinforcements to repel an Edomite invasion. One of the personal letters mentioning the house of Yahweh also, they hold personal names, including priestly families, such as Peshur and Merimoth, both mentioned in the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 20, in verse 1, and in Ezra 8, in verse 33. And we see this inscription. It says, Delishab, and now give the Kittium three baths of wine, and write the name of the day. And from the rest of the first flower, Send one homer in order to make bread bread for them. Give them for the, the wine from the Agonoth vessels. Just a common letter. But it dates back to that time period in the place where it should be, according to the Bible. Well, when we look to Arid, another inscription. It says, from Arid, 50 and from Kin or Kina, and you shall send them to Ramat Negev by the hand of, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Malik Yahu, the son of Kerab, uh, Kerabur, and he shall hand them over to Eli Elisha, the son of Yermiyahu Yer in Ramat Negev, lest anything should happen to the city, and the word of the king is incumbent upon you for your very life. Behold, I have sent to warn you today, get the men to Elijah, lest Edom should come there. Another inscription from Arid. It says your son, Gemar or Gemar Yahu, and Nehemahu, uh, Gretet, Malkiyahu, 
uh, and I for, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing these names. I, I have blessed you to the Lord, and now your servant has listened to what you have said, and I have written to my Lord everything that the man wanted. And Eshiyahu came from you, and no one gave it to them. And behold, you know about the letters from Edom that I gave to my Lord before sunset. And Eshiyahu slept at my house, and he asked for the letter, but I didn't give it. The king of Judah should know that we cannot send, and it's part of it missing, and this is the evil that Edom has done. Notice the mentioning, though, of Judah. These were real places. They actually existed. They're recorded in the Bible, and we see that history records them for us as well. Archaeology has discovered them. What about Megiddo? Megiddo? Megiddo and Tel Dan are associated with some of the Bible's most famous events and people that hold great insight into the past. Well, the conquest of Joshua and the building programs of King Solomon they, locate, they were located in the fertile and strategic Jezreel Valley. The mound of Megiddo rises 100 feet above the valley with layers of history from the Bronze and the Iron Ages. Well, in 1904, the earliest excavation of Megiddo, a seal was discovered, and it belonged to a royal minister of the 8th century BC and was engraved with a roaring lion, the symbol of the Israelite kingdom of Judah. And the inscription on it reads, Belonging to Shema, official of Jeroboam, who we read of in 2 Kings 14. The seal would have been after the death of Solomon when the nation of Israel divided into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern. This lion would be Judah of the southern kingdom, as we read in Genesis 49 and verse 9 and Revelation 5 and verse 5. The question arises as, so why would an official of Jeroboam of the northern kingdom, what would he be doing with a seal featuring the lion? Well, 2 Kings 14 and verses 12 through 14 reveals that Israel's previous king, Joash, routed Judah and captured Amaziah, king of Judah. Joash went to Jerusalem and took all the gold and silver and all the articles found in the temple of the Lord. He also took hostages and returned to Samaria. There is some humor and some irony in this seal. When Jeroboam became king of the ten tribe uh, of Israel, his domain included much of the already captured territory of the kingdom of Judah. To Shema, the official of Jeroboam, it was, this was amusing, so he made a pun from his own personal official seal, uh, or bula, that they are sometimes called, that he used as his seal for his official mail. The roaring lion was the symbol of the southern kingdom of Judah. Imagine his smugness when he stamped an official document to an official in Judah with his own stamp. You can picture him smiling with glee. This is just one part of what we read in the Bible. When we look to Megiddo, another amazing find at Megiddo was made in 2012. In 2010, a clay vessel was found filled with jewelry, but it was not until 2012 that it was examined fully and cataloged. And what we find within this vessel is thousands of beads of gold and silver, carnelian or a semi-precious stone of an orange or amber hue, and a ring seal and nine large gold earrings. Notable among the earrings was the design of a bird and of an Egyptian work, of an, and it's the Egyptian work dating from about 11 BC. And what is notable, notable about this, you may wonder, is that Exodus tells us that the Jews had been slaves in Egypt. Yet when they left during the Exodus, God caused for the people to take the gold and the silver of the Egyptians, when we read Exodus 3 and verse 21 to 22, and they brought this with them. And we see that archaeology helps to authenticate what the Bible has already told us. How did this Egyptian art get there? Trade? Or was it brought with the Israelites as they went on the Exodus out of Egypt? Well, when we look to Hazor, it is described in the Bible as the head of the kingdoms of Canaan. 
in Josiah 11 in verse 10. Located north of the Sea of Galilee in Upper Galilee, Hazor is one of the largest archaeological digs in all of Israel, covering over 200 acres. The dig was reve has revealed 22 layers of occupational debris, with the earliest dating to the 18th century BC. Archaeology has shown it to be a well-fortified administrative center at its height. It also maintained commercial trade with Babylon in Syria, importing large quantities of tin for the bronze industry. And between the 18th and 13th centuries uh, BC, it was an Egyptian vassal state. Documents from the 14th century BC show the king of Hazor swearing loyalty to the Egyptian pharaoh. The book of Joshua tells of Jabin as the king of Hazor and was defeated by Joshua who burned Hazor to the ground. In Joshua 11 verse 1, we also read in Judges 4 and verse 2. Archaeology shows us Hazor was destroyed and rebuilt as a fortified village. We can compare that with Joshua 19 and verse 36. The book of Judges tells us of Barak defeating Sisera, who led an army from Hazor against the Israelites, Judges 4 and verse 7. Now, Sisera, he flees and he hides in the tent of Jael, who puts a tent spike to his head in Judges 4, verses 17 and following. Well, we read of Bethel. And Amos 7, in verses 12 to 13. Bethel is also mentioned in Genesis. When we look to chapters 12 and chapter 13. And it's a place near where Abram stayed and built an altar on his way to Egypt on his return. We read in Genesis 12 and verse 8. And we also read in Genesis 28 that when Jacob is fleeing his brother Esau and he falls asleep on a stone and he dreams of a ladder between heaven and earth and God promised Jacob the land of Canaan, that it is here Jacob anoints a stone with oil and names the place Bethel, the house of God. Genesis 28, verse 19. In 1927, W.F. Albright made an initial excavation of Bethel and a full excavation in 1934. Excavations continued until 1960, and the city was located by the descriptions given in the Bible of it being between Benjamin and Ephraim. The book of Joshua describing it as being close to Ai and next to Luz and near Jericho, and as part of the territory of Manasseh and Ephraim, the descendants of Joseph, as we see in Joseph 7, verse 2, or Joshua 7, verse 2, 8, 9, 16, verses 1 and 4. Eusebius and Jerome, ancient church fathers, historians, they described in their time there being 12, this, this time as being 12 Roman miles north of Jerusalem. Well, in the Old Testament, we see many mentions of the Hittites. This is always one of my favorites. Ephraim the Hittite, Genesis 23 and verse 10. Zohor the Hittite, in Genesis 25 and verse 9. And that God would send hornets to drive out the Canaanites and the Hittites, Exodus 23 and verse 28. That the Israelites should destroy the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, Deuteronomy 20 and verse 17. And in Joshua 1, in 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 1 Chronicles, and Ezekiel. And for ages it was said that the Bible was not accurate because there were no known people ever as the Hittites. The skeptic said, we cannot find any evidence for the Hittite civilization outside of the Bible. This demonstrates that the Bible cannot be trusted as an historical source. Well, then in the 19th century, archaeologists found the city of Hattusa in modern day Turkey. In 1893, the first digs were made, but two world wars and the depression delayed any real excavations. The next major digs were not until 1931, 1961, and 1978, with work still continuing today. This turned out to be the capital city of the Hittite Empire in the late Bronze Era, 1200 to 500 BC. The earliest traces of a settlement there date to the 6th millennium BC or 6000 BC. 
Excavations show that there was a trade commerce with Assur and Assyria. We see that the city had an elaborate gateway structure featuring warriors, lions, and sphinxes. There were four temples and the secular buildings and residential area, as well as a cemetery located outside of the city walls. And they had a system of writing. One of the most important discoveries was the cuneiform royal archives. This held official correspondence and contracts, legal codes, and procedures for cult ceremonies. And at its peak, archaeologists estimate that 40,000 to 50,000 people lived and worked in Hattusa. Evidence shows the city and the government fell about 1200 BC and was slowly abandoned over several decades. And in 800 BC, a Phrygian settlement was made on top of the area. But what we see is that Hattusa existed, the Hittite capital. One of the more interesting finds at Hattusa was a tablet detailing a peace agreement with the Hittites and the Egyptians under Ramesses II in 1259 or 1258 BC. This is after the Battle of Kadesh. It is one of the earliest known examples of an international peace treaty. And this treaty was written on silver tablets in Heropolis, a city in Egypt, and Hattusa, as well as on the wall of the great Karnak Temple in Egypt, and a mile and a half north of Luxor in Egypt. And also interesting is that Hittite literature has appeared in other areas, such as Anatolia, that's Asia Minor, Tabiga, or North Central Turkey, Turkey and Sefanua, or Turkey which has turned out to be a major Hittite religious and administrative center. The Hittite people did in fact exist. They were recorded in the Bible long before people thought that they did not exist. What about Dan? Judges 18 and verse 29, we read of the city of Dan being named. Dan was the northernmost city of the kingdom of Israel, belonging to the tribe of Dan. In 2 Kings 10, verse 29, 2 Chronicles 13, verse 8, it is one of the two cities that Jeroboam erected golden calves as gods to deter the people from going to Jerusalem to worship, and formerly called Laish. It is mentioned in the Mari tablets from the 18th century BC, and the records of them, uh, and there's records of them in the Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose III, his tomb. In 1849, American naval officer William F. Lynch identified the city of Dan. Three years later, Edward Robinson also made the same identification and that this was the biblical city of Dan. Excavations began in 1966 under the direction of Abraham Baran. And as we look to all these cities and more, we see time and time again, the Bible is accurate. Gezer, we read a Gezer in Joshua 16 in verse 10, and Judges 1 in verse 29, 2 Samuel 5, verse 25, 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles. Today, Gezer is an archaeological site in the foothills of the Judean mountains and is an Israel, Israeli national park. Much of the excavations done there were from 1902 to 1909. Located northwest of Jerusalem, it was a major fortified Canaanite city, and in the 1st and 2nd millennium BC, it held a strategic location at the crossroads linking Egypt and Syria. Anatolia and Mesopotamia and the road to Jerusalem and Jericho, all important trade routes. The Amarna letters mention the kings of Gezer swearing loyalty to the Egyptian pharaoh. Of biblical interest is the Canaanite high place with the monumental megaliths, upended stones. And there are 13 inscribed boundary stones in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek making it the first positively identified biblical city. And these stones read Boundary of Gezer and of Alkios, and believed to be the governor of Gezer at that time that it was installed. It also has a Canaanite water system of a tunnel going down to a spring, similar to those found in Jerusalem, Hazor, and Megiddo. It is also known from cuneiform reliefs from the 8th century BC that the royal palace at Nimrud that between 734 and 732 BC, the city was captured by the Assyrian king, tiglath pileser III. And this is important as we know from the Bible that Assyria took the northern kingdom of Israel captive about 732 BC, while the southern kingdom remained. Jerusalem was besieged 
though not captured, we read in 1 Chronicles 5 and verse 26. Also, the deportation of the Israelites took place in the stages uh, and under different kings, as we read in 2 Kings 15, verse 29, and 17, verses 3 through 6, 18, 11 through 13, and Isaiah 20 and verse 1. History confirms this took place under tiglath pileser the third, Shalmaneser the fifth, and Sargon the second, and Sennacherib, all of whom are spoken of in the Bible. The Bible, it's not a history book, per se. It is not a science book. It's not a book of mathematics. It's not a book of medical journal. But what it is, is a book of truth. And as truth, we see time and time again that the Bible is true. The Bible is accurate. I thank you for your time, and I invite you and I encourage you, please turn to your Bible. Read the things we've studied. Don't take my word for it. We see that God speaks for himself, that the Bible is true. And being true, we need to know it. We need to learn it. We need to apply it in our lives. Remember that God loves you, and so do I. Thank you for your time.